growing up, we volunteered every summer collecting food for our local food pantry. My mom would put us in this red wagon. She'd pull us around the neighborhood. And around the time I turned seven, I started to wonder why that was. Why didn't people just go and buy food at the grocery store like we did? And my parents explained. There are a lot of people who work really hard, but they still need some extra help. And there might even be a kid sitting next to me in class who was going hungry. As a seven-year-old, I was outraged. How could we let a kid go hungry? How could we let anyone go hungry? And my parents and I had the same idea. Because we could help, we should. My parents always wanted better for me, and we believed that education was the key. When I was in college, my dad lost his job. One week later, my mom lost her job, and they were both unemployed at the same time for a year. That was incredibly hard on our family, emotionally, financially. But they kept volunteering because they said, nothing puts your own life in perspective like doing something for someone else. So I did the only thing I felt like I could do to help, which was to double down on my education. And I eventually graduated four times. <laughs> Maybe that was overkill. With degrees in business and a PhD in psychology. So you can imagine their pride and my pride when I landed my first job out of school making very good money. One day, I was standing at the window on a particularly hot day, you know, the kind, right? And I was looking out at the landscaping crew. That's not me. <laughs> and they were sweating. It was so hot that day. And as I stood there and I watched them, and I reflected on my own job and what I had accomplished, I suddenly wished that I was out there with them. That was the moment that I realized that I hated my job. So I did the only logical thing that you can do at a brand new job right out of graduate school, which was to quit. Now, this wasn't as easy as it sounded. There were two things stopping me. The first was that I had been working for this for a long time, and I was scared of losing my identity. That was when I realized I wouldn't be losing my identity. I wouldn't lose what made me, me. I would only be losing my label. The next thing was, what would my parents think? They'd worked so hard for me to get here, for me to have this opportunity, that I always wanted better for me. But that was when I realized what they were trying to teach me all along. What is better? And it's not about your career resume. It's about your eulogy resume and what people will say about you after you're gone. So around the time I was quitting my job, a very smart person said, well, this is an amazing opportunity. Why don't you take 30 days and do anything that you want to do? And so for me, that answer was volunteer. I volunteered with 30 different nonprofits over the course of 30 days, and I blogged about it every day. About seven days in, I thought, I'm completely crazy. But it was also one of the most amazing things that I had ever done. Inspired, I wanted to know more. So I drove across the country from Portland, Oregon to Jacksonville, Florida, researching how people find volunteer opportunities and meaningful experiences. And I don't recommend doing this in the winter. Now, what kind of psychologist would I be if I didn't give you some of the research on volunteering? We know volunteerism is positively associated with things like longer life expectancy, higher job satisfaction, better relationships with friends and family. The good news is that you don't have to quit your job to reap the benefits. I'd like to share three ways you can find your life's best work through volunteering. On a bitterly cold night, I was volunteering with an organization called Room in the Inn. They take in homeless guests from around the cities to stay with congregations for the night. Before dinner, they always ask if someone would like to say a prayer. And to everyone's surprise, one of the homeless guests raised his hand. Everyone around the room bowed their heads and got very quiet. He said, I want to thank you for a warm place to sleep. I want to thank you for these kind people, for this food. And I especially want to pray for everyone who's not as fortunate as I am. 
we were all stunned. Here we were thinking that he was the less fortunate, and he was able to see beyond his needs and think of the needs of others. Reflecting, this, reflecting on this through the lens of psychology, I was astonished, because the traditional school of thought is that you have to move through what we call Maslow's hierarchy of needs before you can focus on the needs of others. That you have to meet your own physiological needs, things like food and clothing, before you can focus on your own safety. And then eventually, love and belonging and self-esteem and respect. Now this is where most people stop. They're not struggling, but they're not thriving either. They're just surviving. Most people never make it to the top of this pyramid, to the peak experience, to what it means to be alive. Most people never make it to self-actualization. So how do you get here? It's not actually by focusing on yourself. It's by focusing on the greater self and your role in the world around you. How amazing that this man instantly transcended this pyramid and showed all of us with so much how to be grateful with so little. There's an amazing documentary filmed in Memphis, Tennessee, about a man named Coach Bill Courtney who leaves his life in the suburbs to come and coach a losing high school football team in a very rough part of town. After a little while, he just can't connect with some of the team members, and so he pulls aside a player that he's close to, Jamie, and he says, Jamie, why can't I get through to them? Jamie looks him right in the eye, and he says, well, coach, they're trying to figure out if you're a turkey person. And Coach Courtney says, dude, what's a turkey person? And Jamie says, coach, it's those people who load up their SUVs with turkeys on Thanksgiving Day. And they come to our side of the tracks, and they drop them off, and then we never see them again. So it makes you wonder why they're doing it. Is it because they care about us? Or is it because they can go home and brag to their family and friends about what a great thing they did? That's a turkey person. So now I'm going to say something that sounds a little crazy. The intent should be for the right reasons, but volunteering should also be selfish. And here's why. Because we need you to love it. We need you to love some aspect of it, either what you're doing, who you're doing it for, or why you're doing it, because we need you to come back. About a third of volunteers never come back to that organization or any other organization the following year. That's an economic loss of $38 billion. When you're out volunteering, if you're not thinking, how soon can I come back? You just haven't found the right thing yet. If you love it, we can accomplish so much more. Like when the girl you've been mentoring since she was 12 tells you that she's going to college. Or when Cameron, who lives at the homeless shelter where you volunteer, runs up to you and says, we're moving into our first house. That's where you'll find your life's best work. To help get you there, I'll leave you with this. You want to think about your eulogy before you actually need it. Thankfully, we have a built-in checkpoint every year. Mark Twain says there are two important days in your life. The first is the day you are born. Now, when we are young, we look forward to our birthday. But at some point, not so much. Maybe around age 29, I have a friend who just celebrated the 10th anniversary of her 29th birthday. <laughs> Why is it that we start to dread our birthdays? Maybe it's because we're forced to reflect about what we've accomplished in another year on this earth. Because no amount of presents or birthday wishes will make you feel as full as doing something for someone else. So here's an idea. What if our birthdays aren't about us? Your birthday is not about the day you were born. Your birthday is not about you at all. It's a chance to act, it's a chance to reflect, it's a chance to think of the greater self. So what do you love and what are you good at? How can you use that to make a difference? Because someone out there is waiting for you to act. What will you say was your life's best work? Mark Twain says, there are two important days in your life, the day you were born and the day you find out why. You came here to be inspired and to be challenged. So here's my challenge for you. This year, volunteer on your birthday. And maybe the day you're born will be the day you find out why. Thank you. Thank you.